Good morning, everyone, and welcome. From Notre Dame, Indiana, this is 10 Years Hence. I'm James O'Rourke, a professor of management at the University of Notre Dame's Mendoza College of Business, and I'll be your host for this series. Our speaker today is Malachi Brown, a senior story producer with the New York Times. He specializes in visual investigations, a form of accountability and explanatory journalism that combines traditional reporting with advanced digital forensics, such as analyzing videos, photos, and audio, using satellite imagery, and 3D reconstructions of crime scenes. Maliki has led investigations on policing in America, Russian airstrikes on hospitals in Syria, the Las Vegas mass shooting, chemical weapons attacks in Syria, extrajudicial military shootings in Nigeria, the Saudi officials who killed journalist Jamal Khashoggi in Turkey, and the killing of a young Palestinian medic along the Gaza-Israeli border. Brown and his team's work has led to government inquiries, has been cited at United Nations Security Council meetings and U.S. congressional hearings. It's been used in murder trials and has led Italy to cease arms exports to Saudi Arabia. Brown and his team are recipients of the 2020 Pulitzer Prize for International Reporting, the George Polk Award for International Reporting, Emmy Awards, OPC Awards, and other distinctions. Prior to joining the New York Times in 2016, Brown worked as a reporter and editor at publications in the United States and in Ireland. Malachi is from Broadford, County Limerick, Ireland. So let me say welcome. Good to see you, Malachi. Thanks for being here. Likewise, Jim. Thanks very much for inviting us uh, to this series. Good. Well, we have a topic a series, of course, that's investigating whether we can trust our own eyes, whether we can believe what we see and hear or read. Um, it's topical. There are uh, proceedings today in the Senate of the United States dealing with this very thing. Um, and as we know, both in the political world and in the commercial world of business, the notion of how we know what's true becomes particularly important as we try to make the most important decisions in our lives. Um, I've told you before, and I'm happy to tell anyone else that I turn to the Times, which is in my uh, paper tube each morning, it's on my desk each morning in my uh, campus office. I also turn to many other sources, but I find myself increasingly becoming a skeptic. Can you help us with some of this? Yeah, I mean, no question. Um, we're living in a world that, um, uh, in a country in particular, I think, um, that is divided um, and uh, depending on who you talk to and what their media diet is, um, occupy very different um, versions of the same country and in, in, in their minds. And so the the sort of um, the sort of foundational basis, uh, in fact, upon which um, debates are, are held and, and policy discussions are, are teased out um, and debated, even in, in presidential campaigns um, and political campaigns, um, has has eroded. You know, and that is you know, partly to do with mainstream media, but it's also, um, you know, as, as everybody knows at this stage, you know, largely um, due, due to social media platforms and the way in which um, emotion is rewarded and the, uh, on those platforms, an emotional response to what somebody is seeing, people have been played because of that um, by a variety of actors, but also, you know the the um, the impetus of those platforms to demand and capture more of people's attention, and so all of their their incentive is to to keep you on their platform um, uh, for as long as possible, as well as profiling people, you know, individually, um, and uh, and that that's a dangerous mix, particularly when you think about advertising and political advertising being able to be tailored 
to uh, psychographic profiles of, of individuals, um, which is something that um, we've never had before. Well, my sense is that uh, your real expertise is visual investigations. And for a long time, people believed that it would be possible uh, to tell a lie in a newspaper or to distort um, something that is authentically true and frame it in a way that uh, brought you to a different conclusion. But we always thought we could trust our eyes. We always thought if I see it with my own eyes, if there's video of it, then I know what's going on. Is any of that still true? It's still true if you listen to the right um, journalists and, and look in the right places um, and have a skeptical eye yourself. You know, I think that's all part of it. Um, and, 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 and as we engage with social media, just thinking before we share something, um, you know, why are we sharing it? Does it what's our response to it? Does it provoke something emotional in us? That should give us pause before we share something. But what we do in our work is, you know, there, there is a huge amount of information out there like never before. And, um, and a lot of that is visual as, you know, we go around and document our daily lives um, as satellites uh, orbit our globe and take pictures and videos even now um, every day um, as planes and ships and, and, and all of that are, are tracked as they move around the world. So there's an abundant, an overabundance of information out there that allows you to get to the truth of, um, of an event uh, or a debate um, or a contention, an argument, um, a denial by, a, by a, a government around a human rights abuse. And that's a lot of what our work is, is, is in doing that. It's digging, digging, digging through the uh, online sources, as well as getting on the ground and talking to, to people, combining traditional journalism and s stacking layers and layers of factoids together that present an indisputable picture. And then because a lot of this work is visual, you know, what we found our, our audience in really appreciating is the transparency of the evidence that we present to people as we're, as we're, you know, solving a problem, you know, um, you know, who bombed um, a civilian house in Afghanistan, you know, um, or, you know, who, who shot um, a medic on the Gaza border. And we'll walk through some of those case studies and some okay. of the techniques. Yeah. Good. Well, I know you have some stories to tell us and you've got some pictures to show us. So let yes. me turn it over to you at this point and we'll come back a bit later with questions um, passed along through the, uh, the Q&A function. And uh, I have an assistant who's looking at those, but we'll, we'll pass some along, but let's hear from you first. Okay, um, I'm going to um, share my screen and go through um, a visual presentation and, and really walk through several case studies that kind of illustrate, again, just the amount of information that is available to us and how, as journalists, we think about, you know, collecting and, and analyzing that and, and finding the truth um, of um, a particular event. So let me just share this screen. Can you see this? Yes, indeed. Okay. So our, our team is the visual investigations team at the Times. Um, and uh, here's a little plug for our URL. There's a landing page where you can find a lot of our work and um, much of it is in video form, increasingly um, in interactive form, stories that you read and we write to the visuals and the evidence, um, especially in breaking news um, scenarios because videos take longer to produce. Um, and this is just, it's a, it's a it, it runs the gamut of national stories, international stories, um, you know, supply chain, uh, sanctions, evasions, um, you know, extrajudicial killings, as you said in your introduction, um, and stories that, that happen right on our doorstep, you know, uh, in, in the Bronx. Um, and first of all, just our methodology is to collect and to analyze evidence. And as I said, you know, there's think about how many photographs and videos are posted to Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, TikTok, all of these different platforms um, every single day, uh, which contain clues when you look closer and sort of collect, bring more of them together. And we, we verify those, those images. Are they taken 
where um, they're purported to be taken, when and who took them and what might be their motives for taking them. Um, and often we're verifying them and cross corroborating them against each other, but also with satellite imagery, you know, before and after satellite imagery taken 24 hours apart can confirm, for instance, that this building was bombed on a particular day. Um, and we also include ship and plane trackers uh, in, um, in, in our reporting. Um, and satellite data as well as satellite imagery, these are recent images from um, uh, Ethiopia and um, these are, sorry, Eritrea. Um, and this is uh, fire data that is captured through infrared signals um, by satellites every day and, and they show where fires are, are happening. And we had heard reports that there were scorched earth policy um, being, being carried out there. And so by looking a little bit closer in on those dots and those streets, you know, you can see that agricultural land and then getting the satellite imagery for those specific areas. This is a, a, a clue that leads us closer to finding visual proof that in fact, um, these buildings are being raised and this agricultural land is being raised as well. Um, you know, and in our, you know, we, we're very much identifying weapons and we look for serial numbers on bomb fragments and, and, and all of that, that are, might be not immediately obvious when you're looking at a video or a photograph, but are really valuable, um, data to allow us to track back well, what air force or what army is using that particular weapon. Um, if you know the, the general location and then 3d reconstructions, and I'll walk through a couple of those. Um, these can be really immersive and put, put you, the viewer, into the situation, but they're also very good reporting tools as well. Um, and just the, the first, one of the first big stories that we produced was around the Las Vegas um, shooting. And it, it was a really horrific event, as everybody knows. Um, and, you know, the police were really um, tight-lipped at the time about the evidence that they were releasing to the public. And, Conspiracy theories started to swirl because they changed the timeline of events and, you know, they came under scrutiny because um, of their response time and there were questions about whether the police were trying to cover something up. I don't believe they were, but um, it didn't help uh, and the narrative shifted very, very quickly, at least in the online world. And we sought to uh, develop a timeline of what happened independent of uh, the authorities using um, the videos that people kept filming despite the rampage of, of bullets. Um, I'm just going to skip past this. And the, the first step in that is searching for the Route 92 Festival, Las Vegas shooting, um, all of the keywords um, that you would associate um, with the event across multiple uh, platforms and then collecting them into a folder, organizing them and watching them. And as I'm watching them, listening to patterns in the in the video as awful as those bursts of fire were each one had a kind of a fingerprint if you like um you know the the duration of the of that burst of fire the interval to the next one and the duration of that one the rate of um gunfire within each burst of fire the sort of like the, the pattern of it because he wasn't using standard uh, automatic weapons he was using bump stocks uh and and they they kind of alter they increase the rate of fire but um, they, they jam sometimes. And what I realized in watching these videos is that, oh, this one ca could capture maybe the second to the fifth one. This one might be the fourth to the eighth. And then by overlapping them, we could kind of reconstruct what happened. Uh, do a bullet count. Each of these spikes is, um, you know, the crack of a bullet or the thud of, the, of his weapon in the background. Um, uh, and, you know, as we stitch all of these together, it became apparent that we could actually see and analyze the entire event and reconstruct it um, from beginning to end, um, from multiple angles, uh, and including the five minutes before and several minutes after as well, I think five, 10 minutes after. Um, and this is a video editing software where you're, you're seeing the, the sort of the, the, the sound wave of each clip. Um, and this is just, you know, a spreadsheet where we're, we often lay out our information so that we can organize it and, and parse it and analyze it. And one just, you know, there were many curiosities, there were many um, things that this allowed us to do to interrogate the police response, where they responded, the, the medical response to it, where the gunman was shooting at different points in time. 
this orange line that you see was a curiosity because only one camera picked it up. None of the cameras that were filming at the venue across the street, several hundred yards away, picked up that round of fire. Just one camera by a uh, that video by a taxi driver uh, at the hotel um, picked it up, and it was a more muted and muffled one. And um, through our reporting, we knew that um, some of the hotel staff had came up, come on, under fire in the hallway, and that was one of those moments where he he um, fired through the door at the hotel staff who distracted him long enough for many people to escape the fairground and, and unquestionably those people saved lives um, because there was a gap in his in his shooting rampage um, like little little granular detail like that is possible to extract from it um, one of the key things in in videos in this type of reporting is to turn what we call open sources on social media into primary sources who can provide you the the raw video direct from the device and as you can see here there's it's it's got the the hour the the day hour minute and second that the video was recorded and that gives us a very precise timestamp and when you sort of collect combine that with other timestamps that you see in the police body cam footage you know the other videos as we watch them frame by frame you're picking these out and plotting them on that timeline that i showed you which allows us to trace it back to okay it, it happened in this five second it started in this five second time frame and and then we we are able to work for forward um and so it's almost what the police would do when they're investigating it and in, in collecting um live streams and police body cam footage and 911 calls and all the rest of it um and in fact we did do that we got the hotel security audio 911 calls um uh, radio traffic by the uh, emergency medical responders um, and that gave us extra layers of context. Um, and then also our graphics team, Anjali Singhvi is a really talented um, graphics reporter who we work with regularly, um, got the floor plans and, um, and was able to model out the apartment building, you know, stitched photographs together. There were, you know, video tours and uh, 3D tours um, of the, the suite that Stephen Paddock rented. And that just, again, gave us uh, additional information about his movements um, and um, again also the crime scene photographs showed us just the, the number of of um, uh, of weapons that he had so it allowed us to stitch us stitch all of this together into a sort of a definitive timeline of, of what happened as awful as it was and answer a lot of the questions that were um, that people had in their minds um, another story is a total diff totally different um, scenario a chemical weapons attack in Syria which was forcefully denied by the Syrian government and their military partners uh, in Russia. Um, a chlorine canister landed on the balcony of a building, um, which in an area that was under intense siege, military siege over um, you know, several days, but in, in particular, one 24 hour period. Um, and, you know, our question was, well, who, who, who done it? And, uh, and so when you think about that question and you think, about, well, how did it happen? Where did it happen? When did it happen? Why did it happen? Um, and and we, we went about collecting a lot of um, visual material and evidence around that. Um, it was difficult because communications were down on that day. So, so intense was the, the bombardment. Uh, and so only fragmentary pieces of videos and um, uh, and, and so forth uh, were available on the day. Um, satellite imagery wasn't as clear as we would have liked it to be to have been. And people were also shipped out. Many of the witnesses were bussed out to refugee camps because um, the Syrian government took control of that area. And uh, members of the opposition who were who were in there um, or who were sympathetic to the opposition left the area. So. On the, that 24 hours, in that 24 hours, you can see in the satellite imagery, that's the day before uh, on the left-hand side here, and that's the day previous. You can see that, that this particular street was entirely obliterated. And, and that street, that indicated that this particular street was a focus of the military campaign. A question we had was, well, why? Um, at the end of that street was an, end, uh, an underground, uh, a tunnel to the underground hospital over at the building you see across the, the roundabout. And this was an ambulance run. And so they were cutting off access to 
um, to the hospital. And this was the last remaining hospital. And this is all part of a pattern that we see in Syria, crush civilian life, force a surrender, the population to surrender, make, make life unbearable um, in, in the, these opposition areas. And they obliterate, as you can see, like lots of houses and, and apartment blocks uh, in doing that. All of these other apartment blocks you can see shaded or pockmarked. Um, and this video, this is just a video that's filmed from the balcony, um, that yellow canister that you saw in the first slide, and they're panning now across the area. And, and this is what we do is we, we geolocate um, you know, the, the buildings that you see in the footage so that we know that the chemical attack happened at the end of that street on this H-shaped building here. Um, and uh, in the course of our reporting, we'll use satellite imagery to model that building and to lay out the evidence uh, in there. These are various different satellite images, images that allow us to measure the dimensions of it, get a, a, a sort of a side angle on it, uh, establish the number of floors that are on it, uh, measure its height and so forth. And although there were these fragment only sort of five, six, 10 second clips, we watched through them and stitched them together to show that they were all filmed in the same apartment block by connecting the corner of a staircase with, you know, the in one video with um, the same angle from another video that might go up the stairs and show where the victims were. These were really horrific videos. Um, but allowed us to create a 3D model of the uh, of the building and to map out where the victims were um, uh, in the building and and and, uh, and where they died. A lot of them were near water sources, which I'll, I'll return to in, in a moment. Um, and then videos of the bomb. These are the videos on the left hand side, uh, in between camera shoots. Um, so the only people that were uh, given access to the um, balcony where the bomb landed were activists who uh, and residents in the area before they were shipped out and they ran upstairs took photographs and videos of it and then russian tv crews who were allowed access by the russian military police afterwards in between those shoots they kind of twisted the bomb around and turned it over and so we had imagery of the entire surface of the bomb and by getting the um specifications of it we were able to um do this sort of photogrammetry mapping on, on it, onto it and create this model of the bomb within our 3D model. Imagine putting a digital glove on and reaching into our digital model and turning it around to see what the what, what uh, evidence was inscribed on the, on the weapon. Um, and so this is, an, this is exactly what our model looked like. Um, and we're examining both the markings on the weapon, but also uh, on the uh, it, how it relates to the evidence that's strewn around that balcony. Again, lots of visual clues here. Um, so this looks like a jumble of metal, but actually over on the right-hand side here, you see little uh, an axle and small wheels. Uh, over on the left-hand side, you see a fin. Um, and this is something that we had seen multiple times before um, in uh, these attacks. It fit perfectly onto the onto the weapon. It fit perfectly the, the dimensions, and this is a rigging that is used on these crude bombs as they're rolled out of the back of helicopters to stabilize them in flight and make sure that they create drag at the rear of it, ensure they fall nose down and they crack open. Um, and so that was a clue that this thing was designed to fall from the sky, to be deployed from the sky, and not just placed there. Um, as the Syrian government um, claimed that this was all staged. And here's a, an example of, of what that looks like when it doesn't um, fall apart, uh, a, a, another chemical attack. What was also interesting is when we turned it over on the underside, there was this lattice marking on it. Um, and we measured the dimensions of that lattice. And there was also um, this wire mesh um, that had collapsed from the the top of the balcony with the web, with the with the uh, canister, the weight of the canister, um, and those dimensions matched perfectly. So not only is it it, it hit it at great force basically to make that imprint onto the canister. So now we've got two critical clues that it's designed to fall from um, the sky, and also that it that it hit this balcony at great force and also cracked open the uh, cement, uh, the, the 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 roof. Um, another thing is this is the first person who ran in and was coughing with the smell of the chlorine as they ran in and they, they uh, in, up the stairs and into that uh, upstairs bedroom and they, they 
cast their camera just in a second across the ceiling and you picked up this image and it doesn't reveal much. And actually we thought initially it was the sort of the clouds uh, in the sky. Um, but when we brightened it, we could see actually it's sitting, it's a, a photograph of the canister uh, sitting in the hole that had punctured in the roof, being held up by rebar. Um, and uh, it's got the same dimension, same contours as it. And actually the photographs in the morning uh, that were taken in daylight showed in the exact same position. Um, and so why is this one uh, on the right yellow and why is the one on the left um, white? We contacted the Chlorine Institute and they said that when these highly pressurized chlorine canisters um, open and the chlorine spills out, what happens is a, a process called auto refrigeration. Just like you hold down a deodorant can at, for you know, several seconds, it gets cold inside. The change of pressure is so, so uh, intense that if the liquid chlorine inside goes to minus 29 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, it freezes any moisture on the outside of the uh, canister. And they had all of these measures on, on, on uh, and experiments that they sent us on how long that takes and the rate of um, release and all the rest of it. So that meant, that was critical because that meant that this was an active weapon. It, it, uh, when this image was taken on the left-hand side, that was very soon after the chlorine had been deployed from the, the highly pressurized canister because the layer of ice was formed on it and it didn't have time to melt off. Um, and uh, that's- I, I saw some Cyrillic in, inscription, pardon the interruption, but I saw some Cyrillic inscription and I'm wondering what that tells you uh, about the origin of these weapons. Uh, we didn't, we didn't get, the, where did you see the Cyrillic inscription? Uh, there, um, what am oh, I there. looking at just above the, um, uh, the timing mark? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh. across the bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's oh, So is that a television image imposed there? Indeed. This is uh, a, a recording by Russian media um, uh, that's, that's broadcast by them with their particular narrative um, about what had happened here. And uh, unbeknownst to the Russian media, um, they provided us really with a wealth of visual information for us to analyze, um, which, which, which allowed us to sort of reconstruct the, the, the crime scene digitally. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. Yeah. Um, and um, so again, this is a behavior we had seen in previous, um, previous attacks. This is another chemical attack. And you can see that layer of frost as the liquid uh, chlorine sits um, at, the, uh, at the bottom of the barrel, this layer of frost forms over it. And so by finding that person and tracking him down, and you remember I mentioned metadata earlier on, if we can establish when that video was taken, then we can establish when that attack happened. Was it staged? Is this an old attack? Um, images recirculated, or did it happen on the night uh, of April 7th? When we have those satellite imageries, we have all of the testimony, we have all of these other images and reports that there was a chemical attack, and indeed it did. We took us weeks to track this guy down. Um, he was in Turkey at the time, and uh, we, we got the metadata from, from him. We also had, um, you know, experts in chemical weapons exposure, uh, analyze the images, which are really horrific. Um, and, uh, and that's it. And then this, this we do, you know, we presented this as a video, uh, augmented reality, where you could like use your phone to navigate the crime scene, but also uh, in print as well. Um, another, uh, and just to give you a sense, that took about uh, six, six or seven of us about two and a half months to report and produce that story. Um, uh, this one was longer, it was about six or seven months, and um, it involved a lot of underground reporting in Gaza, as well as uh, from our, our uh, desks in, in New York. And this was um, the uh, unfortunate shooting and killing of Razan al-Najjar, who was a volunteer medic on the protest fields in Gaza. Um, and again, once we heard that she uh, had been killed uh, and um, you know, this was somebody we had interviewed, our team had interviewed um, a couple of weeks prior, Yusser al Hlu and Neil Collier when they were over there um, <clears throat> and were really struck by her charisma and, and, and her um, dedication to volunteerism, her pacifism as well. And um, 
we invest, started investigating what happened here. Again, collecting the, the media, uh, organizing it from wire photographers who were there, uh, stitching it all together in a, in a Google spreadsheet. Because we got, I think it was 1300 photographs and videos from over 40 devices, we had all of their metadata and that allowed us to create a chronology. And even though we weren't witnesses on that day ourselves, we could stitch this together from multiple angles and see what happened. And the moments of um, uh, increased aggression, the inflection points, uh, when the Israeli uh, soldiers pulled out their guns and when they started firing and who they fired at as well. And the this precise minutes that they fired. Um, and again, going frame by frame through the footage, this is this, this particular bullet hit one medic in the leg and continued its path and um, uh, hit Razan al Najjar in the aorta. And so by slowing down this footage and going frame by frame, we can see Rami, the medic who was um, hit in the leg, holding his thigh as he's running back, and then he falls to the ground immediately after. You can barely see that they have this um, uh, white, or sorry, this pink strip on their white um, vests. and there was nobody else wearing that particular pink and so often what we would do with these images to find the medics is to oversaturate the images for that pink and it would just pop out um muhammad he was hit by shrapnel when the the bullet and um, skimmed the ground um again just verifying rami's story these are pictures um from uh the ambulances he was taken away um and you can see this bullet when went right through a group of medics who were tending to injured protesters um, and uh, this is what it looks like. This is going to play. And sadly, that's not playing. But what we do is we'll sync up different videos of that moment and sort of try to get a, a mind map of what's going on from different uh, different perspectives. Um, and then also, if a camera is panning out, panning the crowd, we can create this almost like um, panoramic view because it was important to see what was going on between the crowd and the protesters at the fence. Um, and then using drone um, cameras, we created um, uh, a 3D model of the entire area, and we started to plot people into that area and retrace the trajectory of the bullet. Um, and we were able to trace it back to uh, an area. Again, this is a moment where uh, the bullet whips through the crowd. We were able to, tr to trace it back to a sand berm where um, we knew, knew that three soldiers were um, situated and we had photographs of them pulling out their weapon just in the minutes beforehand and we're able to sort of um, retrace that and show exactly what happened um, and then analyze the justification for that use of force because you know le lethal force is allowed when there's an immediate threat to life um, but there was nobody within you know 140 yards of that fence in that moment um, and so that was a question that we we put to the Israeli Defense Forces when we interviewed them. Um, it, this involved obviously a lot of on the ground um, reporting as well, talking to the medics who tried to save her life, um, and uh, and and um, getting out onto the protest field, getting an understanding of the lay of the land, and using satellite imagery to get accurate measurements and that sort of stuff as well. Um, Sometimes video isn't available, um, and this is an investigation into the high-profile killing of Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, um, March of, of last year. And <clears throat> just quickly to sort of walk you through that process, what do you do when the police don't use their body cams or there's no other witness video? Um, you know, in we we obtained um, around again around thirteen hundred uh, crime scene photographs, and as we looked at them, it was really horrifying to see the um, amount of gunfire that riddled that apartment, uh, hit chairs, walls, went into neighbors, two neighboring apartments. Um, you know, they were fired from the outside through you know blinds, um, in through the windows, went right through the right through you know kitchen everyday objects, right through the saucepans cereal boxes, the shower, um, uh, you know, punctured the wall, um, you know, just went everywhere. Those, those bullets went into almost every room in her apartment, out through the roof, up through the, the, na the neighboring apartment upstairs and, and, and out through the roof. And uh, as I spoke to people about this, they still didn't really understand what happened. The police were returning fire, but people 
thought that there was a gunfight between um, the police and a drug dealing boyfriend uh, of Breonna Taylor's. In fact, the target of that um, investigation was an ex-boyfriend of, of Breonna Taylor's um, who, but who she had cut off ties with uh, in the recent past, but because he, he, he was in and out of prison and used her address for his phone bills and his banking uh, accounts and the, the uh, police had um, photographed him picking up mail, that apartment became um, part of the investigation. Um, we also looked at the SWAT team, although the police that raided it didn't um, use body cams, the SWAT team that turned up afterwards did. And so that was also valuable crime scene evidence for us. Um, and, you know, in our minds, as shocking as this is, how can we use this evidence to sort of recreate what happened? And of course, we were able to, um, because the bullet holes were everywhere, we had photographs of all of the bullet holes, we were able to retrace those tra trajectories. Um, and so that's what we started to do again with Anjali Singhvi, who's a, uh, again an architect and really talented modeler. We got um, you know models of the the uh, apartment, but also with the photographs and photos that and videos I took outside, we were able to get the dimensions right and really create an accurate version of her apartment with all of the furniture and household objects in place, um, and uh, and sketch out the trajectories of the bullets as they pass through uh, you know. The, the, walls and cupboards and ceilings and whatnot. Um, get the perspectives of the um, of Brianna and her boyfriend as they were inside. That's the front door that the police rammed through. The, the apartment is uh, in complete darkness. Uh, and the perspectives of the police from outside, what they would have seen looking in. And again, these are the, tra the trajectories of all of the bullets that were fired, which when you see is really kind of um, striking. Um, and then we um, developed that into a you know, a fully rendered model with all the brickwork and all of the um, using the photographs, putting the photographs right into their um, into their place and retracing the, the trajectories of the bullets. These are the bullets that were fired from outside one of the windows through one of the windows and in through the apartment, hitting the walls and continuing back into the neighbor's apartments. Um, and then, you know, there were hours and hours of uh, interviews with the police who conducted the raid, but also with um, Kenneth Walker on the bottom right here, who was her boyfriend, who was in the apartment at the time. And he's the guy who fired one shot low to the ground and hit one of the police in the leg when they burst the door in because he didn't know in his testimony uh, that the police were there um, and that they were police. This was around 1 a.m. Um, and so by listening to their testimony, um, we, we were able to create a picture of what happened, where the police were positioned, how they moved, where they ran, who fired when, uh, how they fired and what they were seeing. Uh, and so this is kind of what it looks like in the end, you know, um, like plotting out the positions and how it unfolded, the, the, the positions of the police, highlighting them as they're talking. So this is a video a documentary that puts um, what happened into their own words um, and allows them to tell the story. But also we're looking at where the casings landed, where the trajectories of the bullets were um, and showing, uh, you know, what that looked like. Um, and then crucially, um, you know, listening to the 911 calls and the, um, the statements given by neighbors to the police who were investigating. The police who were investigating afterwards were really keen on one detail. Did the police announce themselves? Could they be heard? Could they clearly be heard inside the apartments? And none of the neighbors around uh, Brianna um, knew that. And what we wanted to do here was show the proximity of those neighbors to the police who were, who were ramming the door in. Um, and, um, you know, the neighbors upstairs who were awake heard nothing. The neighbors over here who had a window open um, and they heard a commotion, they said, but they didn't hear any police announcing themselves. Um, and when they called 911, they said, please they get the police out here. They didn't realize the police were there. Um, and so that, that's, you know, that was um, sort of revealing. And then we're also looking at the ballistics evidence and tying particular bu bullets and trajectories to specific guns and the guns to those officers. There were lots of different labels used across different reports. And so that, again, required spreadsheeting to connect the dots between all of those. And then also getting on the ground in Louisville to give an impression of how this killing and also the killing of David McAtee and of course in the context of George, George Floyd's killing, how that city has really been roiled by um, 
by the issue of, of race uh, and policing. Um, um, maybe if we have time for one last one, perhaps. Um, the Russia tapes, um, again, yeah. using similar techniques. Um, in 2019, <clears throat> a familiar pattern in Syria was being repeated. I talked earlier about the, the crushing of civilian life. That included bombing bakeries, schools, and uh, hospitals. And if you think about hospitals as sort of the last place of refuge that have been protected for, gener for, for centuries under the, the laws of war, there was evidence that this was a deliberate uh, um, military strategy to attack uh, underground hospitals, field hospitals, ambulances, um, and to again, really crush uh, the will to live in these uh, in these um, areas. This is a particular area called Idlib in the northwest of Syria. Um, and the military campaign kind of uh, kicked off again there around uh, end of April, early May 2019, uh, intense bombardment. Um, again, there's a whole series of this on, on, on this story that you can find uh, again on Invisual Investigations. There's, um, there's actually a playlist of um, of stories, a collection of stories that you can find about these incidents, but also other civilian attacks, um, attacks on doctors um, who were captured, uh, interrogated, and tortured um, during their interrogations, uh, and also the effect of this a, a mass exodus of um, 900,000 people, um, no, again, further north, many of them have been uh, already displaced multiple times through this conflict really horrific uh, consequences. But a lot of this involved data journalism. Um, there are many different organizations who have been documenting attacks on hospitals and other civilian sites. And we collected a lot of that evidence against Syria. You know, at one point in the Syrian war, there was more content, more videos available, um, uh, the length of which exceeded the duration of the war. It has been the most documented war, um, you know, that we've seen. And that has valuable evidence for us. And so we're collecting lots of videos of these incidents, um, the list of hospitals that have been put out of service or attacked, um, various different other sort of um, incident reports, um, and, 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 and connecting and synthesizing all of this data into basically a master spreadsheet of, uh, of all of the, the hospitals. What's um, you know even more horrifying is that many of these uh, hospitals uh, provided their coordinates to the United Nations who then um, circulated them to the warring parties and basically said these are off limits these are ho civilian hospitals you know even if they're they're treating the population providing um, you know essential health care to the civilian population even if they're um, treating combatants you know they're protected uh, under international law and under the Geneva Conventions. And this deconfliction is, you know, the UN wouldn't provide us the list, but by interviewing the managers and the supporting organizations for all of these hospitals, we were able to find out which ones were deconflicted and which weren't by the through the UN system. Now, the 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 sort of the you know, we can't say this with certainty, but certainly if Russia is receiving the coordinates of, of all of these hospitals and they compete, they keep um, bombing them, A, that's a failure on their part. They're supposed to protect hospitals even if they don't have the coordinates. But what's even more horrifying is that they, they could in, in fact be using this as a target list rather than, um, you know, the opposite. And so we start, we use Google Earth to map out a lot of this evidence, the locations of hospitals, photographs, videos, where they're taken. Um, and throughout the Syrian conflict, um, a lot of these um, uh, civilian networks, civilian observer networks popped up and they would observe airplanes as they're taking off from, from um, the airports, the directions that they're going in, and they would uh, log it in a spreadsheet and say, okay, flight is going, or uh, airplane uh, MiG-23 Russian is going north towards Kafranabal. Uh, that would be logged in and it would be sent out as, a, as an alert. If the plane is circling, um, that would be sent out as an alert to people's phones, on Twitter, uh, on Facebook. And so these were real-time alerts that were going out. What they were also doing was listening into the open radio transmissions, just like people listen into police scanner audio here um, in the US. Um, 
you know, they, the, the pilots were communicating with ground control on these open radio frequencies, both the Russian and Syrian pilots. Um, and so that was also part of their intel. Somebody had the smart idea of recording those uh, um, conversations and we obtained those. Um, and, you know, sometimes they would um, give the coordinates, they would share the coordinates. And in this case, there's an underground hospital that had those coordinates um, shared. Uh, they were given a warning that there was uh, military aircraft heading in that direction. So they got out of there. Um, uh, but that was, you know, absolute proof that the Russian military was bombing hospitals, have the coordinates, they set up the um, attack, and then we have video evidence of them at that time uh, because we got the metadata. Uh, again, you know, this is Kafir Nabil, a hospital that this is the second airstrike on it in that day. They bombed it three times, five minutes apart, and that's very often the Russian pattern. And this is the seventh time that hospital has been um, bombed. It's been refurbished by the WHO, by the funding from the Japanese government. It's now built deep underground. Um, uh, but again, a witness um, filmed that. Um, and be using those, uh, what you're seeing here is translations of the, the Russian um, uh, pilots conducting their, their airstrikes. It took us weeks and months to translate all of those um, recordings, but we detected patterns in how they prepared um, for their airstrike. They would um, receive coordinates, uh, get a correction on the coordinates, uh, calculate the minute that they were going to bomb it, get three sevens, which is um, uh, permission to carry out the attack, and then confirm that they had dropped the bombs. Um, again, the timing of the videos was really important because for the first time, we could, if we, if we got our verification of the videos of those attacks right, we could relate what was going on on the ground or what was going on in the skies. Um, and that's what we did here with um, CCTV footage from inside. Um, now, although the clocks were off, the CCTV cameras were a few minutes ahead, um, the interval between that pilot, number 31, carrying out his attacks, and there were no, no other attacks that we know of going on at that time, and dropping the bombs down, um, fits precisely with the CCTV capturing the shuttering of that building as it's uh, struck. And again, those logs that I talked about where people were visually observing aircraft in the area put Russian aircraft uh, in Kafarnabel at that time. This is just a, a spreadsheet that shows you what those recordings look like. Um, you know, we had code words for the ground control, the pilots, like really granular data, coordinates that they were using, which indicated where they were at a certain time. Um, again, often the cameras would shoot up and we're able to see from the camouflage or the wing positions or the models uh, of these aircraft who's flying them. Lots of conversations with, um, with experts in the military who, who helped us and former Soviet and Syrian, a defected Syrian pilot who helped us uh, in identify aircraft and, and, and attack patterns. Again, before and after satellite imagery and looking at the weapons and the blast analysis the power of those weapons because we we understood what um, firepower the different um, uh, people had and then witnesses again were really important getting the whatsapp messages of doctors as they're under attack um, and that gives us a precise timestamp as well as the videos so just layering all of this evidence together kind of gives you um, like conclusive proof um, I could keep going I mean there's you know other examples but you can watch them on the New York Times website. Good. Well, Maliki, thank you for that. That was, I think, a fascinating walk through both your skill set and the technology. So I have a few questions. And then we've got a long list of questions from our uh, viewers and listeners. Let me sort of close the loop here on what it is you do. How many other people on Earth do this outside of a government? How many in the media uh, or in private industry uh, would do what you do? In media, you're probably talking about um, maybe 50, maybe 50 to 100 people, I would say worldwide. Um, there are groups like Bellingcat who are very good. Um, I used to work with a company called Storyful, which did this in a breaking news context, but didn't take the investigative um, uh, um, approach. 
Um, there are there's a small team now in the Washington Post who have started up, and uh, Wall Street Journal have started, uh, and BBC Africa and B BBC Middle East have a couple of people who specialize in this type of reporting. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're they're and then they're they're in, you know, in I suppose law enforcement and and, and those sort of investigative authorities. I, I guess there are people who do that as well. I I have to presume that people in the agency, the Central Intelligence Agency, NSA, and other uh, MI6 uh, have these capabilities uh, in order to analyze visual data to draw conclusions regarding what their government's next action is going to be. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but it, it, it seems to me that one of the key aspects to reporting fully and truthfully, fairly, accurately, completely, is access. And I think I've known that intuitively for a very long time, but uh, I don't think I ever saw it played out quite so well as I did in 1982. I was an officer in the Air Force. Um, I was teaching at the Air Force Academy and the Falklands War began in March or April and accelerated through June. And the one thing we knew is we saw the same footage of sheep every night on the television because nobody else had any pictures of the Falklands. And so we saw the same sheep and there was an update then with a report. Uh, you couldn't have a report unless you had access. And then uh, when the Royal Marines pulled up their rucksacks because they had lost their vehicles when the Atlantic conveyor went down and marched into Port Stanley. Uh, and this was like 60 kilometers. And as soon as the Union Jack went up in front of government house at Port Stanley, that picture was on the front page of every newspaper in London. Suddenly Mrs. Thatcher had a use for those images. Mm -hmm. uh, how is it you get access? And is that something that concerns you? I mean, do you buy these satellite images with your MasterCard? Uh, you just go online? Um, you used to be able to do that, but, the, but one of those services was, was taken offline. We have right. um, you know, relationships with satellite imagery companies. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think some, depending on the service provider, there, there are charges are, you know, are not. It's the same as like wire photography, you know, for us, except there's evidence within it, you know, um, and it can be, you know, it can be really revealing, you know, if, if you know, we're, we're tracking this, speaking of the CIA, if they're building like a, a, a sort of like a secret drone base in the middle of the desert in Niger, you know, if we have the right lead, we're able to go and and monitor the development of that drone base or, or what exactly is going on there uh, and ask the questions why. Um, so, um, yeah, so that, that, that can be quite revealing. You can also kind of, you know, I think cl climate scientists use it quite extensively to see sort of changes over time. Sure. Um, but, you know, business intelligence and, and, uh, you know, they, they use it to look at the number of cars in a, in particular shopping malls and so that they can sort of estimate the footfall and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so it's used in a whole variety of different ways. To what extent are, are you dependent on ordinary citizens sharing cell phone imagery? Hugely. Uh, is that a big part of it? Yeah, hugely, hugely. I mean, you know, we see this very much almost as a collaboration between sources who are documenting what's happening on the ground. Um, because if you think about the example of the Falklands, you know, there there is... Um, that image, if you're relying on sort of government sources to provide you with the imagery, you know, there, <laughs> that's one dimension uh, of, of a particular story. And there's obviously like, you know, political motives to publishing the, the, the photograph that you're describing with the British flag raised in the Falklands. Um, so we use multi sources, multiple sources, you know, we will use police body cam footage and dash cam footage, but we also want to, um, you know, go beyond that. Um, and citizen footage, um, citizen journalism, as it used to be called, citizen media, is um, an essential part of what we what we do. Um, if you think about the Capitol riot recently, although the mainstream media were 
you know, hunted away and, and attacked actually during that, um, that riot. The participants documented every second of that from all over the capital. And so they incriminated themselves um, in, in what they were doing, even though they believed fervently um, in the merits of doing it at the time. Um, and so I've never seen as much media out of that. I mean, like, you know, too much for us to even watch, you know, we've, we've spent weeks watching it through and sort of analyzing it and parsing it. Um, but, but that's the kind of it. I see it as evidence. Um, and we can use that evidence to um, sort of create a picture and clear the fog of chaos of that event or whatever it might be. Okay. One of our listeners has uh, put a question to us asking, how easy or difficult would it be for a bad faith actor to use the same techniques, technology, and equipment to put forth a distorted or falsified version of an important story that they don't want told in other ways. How easy would that be? Yeah, it's definitely possible. Um, and if you think about that example that I gave about the chemical attack in Syria, um, you know, the Russian media have started to use some of the techniques that Bellingcat and us and, and, and other groups use to sort of to um, find accountability for, for crimes. They, they use the same methods uh, and the same data, but they'll twist it. And so there was one famous incident where there was a, a hospital that was bombed again, and um, the Russian media again collected this this footage to show that it wasn't in fact uh, bombed. And if you look at the satellite imagery, with the before and the after, but what they did is they cut off the 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 side of the hospital that was bombed. And so they're presenting this as a fait accompli. Look, we've done the due diligence, um, uh, but actually, if you slid that image over you would actually see it. And so they were outed by that. But of course, you know, most of the Russian public at that stage have seen it on broadcast on, 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 on Russian media and, and, and sort of take it at face value. And will not one see the, it. One of the things we sometimes fail to acknowledge is that when people see it on television or they see moving images and hear sound uh, live stream um, or recorded they say, well, I know what happened because I've seen it with my own eyes. But I think it's important to acknowledge somebody had to arrive there with a camera. Somebody had to turn it on and point it in a particular direction. And then they had to make the decision when to stop shooting, when to upload, um, and perhaps make editing decisions along the way. So um, it's possible to manipulate even that. So one of our, our listeners said um, that he or she was curious about your the metadata that you look at in your sources. Um, do you have to check that? How do you do that? I know there are fact checkers on every story. I periodically am called by the Times uh, to fact check a story. How do you fact check metadata? Great question. Um... Sometimes, uh, I mean, the, the, the short answer is that it's kind of like who's your second source, who's your third source, who's your fourth source. Mm. If, you're, if you're talking to people or talking to individuals in, say, the Biden administration, um, that's what we do. It's, it's rarely one piece of evidence. It's the accumulation of all of the pieces of evidence. Um, one of the examples I was going to show next was, in fact, um, the bombing of a, a, an IDP camp. And there was one, there were plenty of videos of the aftermath. There was no video of the moment, but there was one photograph of the plume of smoke coming out of it. And um, the, uh, we knew that the time was off because it was, cl it was close to sunset. Uh, and, and they, although it was filmed or photographed uh, within the hour after, after it, it couldn't have been of, the, of, of that moment, in that moment, because you look at an online sun calculator and you can see like what, what when the sun goes down. Um, and by contacting that source and finding and, and saying, okay, don't change the clock settings on your device. Please just put your iPhone up against it or take a photograph right now in this instant and send it to us. We get it and we get the error and then that becomes our yardstick and then we can correct it. And mm -hmm. so if we ever have questions about that, we'll, we'll do that. Um, and that's sort of one of the ways 
um, you saw it with the CCTV footage in the in, in the inside the hospital. So it's always the accumulation of evidence. It's layering fact upon fact upon fact upon fact and really careful uh, cross checking of that information. I, I recall in my days in the military, I, uh, I was impressed with the rate of improvement in technology and um, I was, you know, my anything I know is 30 years old, so I'm current as of 14 August 1990. But um, I used to, I used to watch the improvement in visual imagery uh, and the Nun Baker cameras uh, in particular, and the resolution would come down from three meters to one meter to, you know the point at which you could read a headline on a newspaper from outer space. And I thought, this is pretty good. Uh, what improvements are you looking forward to? What technology looks as though it may be on the horizon that you might be interested in? Yeah, I mean, satellite imagery keeps getting better. If you think about Planet Labs as one of our service providers, and they have a constellation of, of satellites that are imaging the Earth every almost every inch of it every day. and if you just think about this, they just brought them all closer to Earth, um, you know, oh. in the, in the last year, and so the the resolution has has gone up, and so, like, that's just amazing in itself. So if you um, leave the house, behave yourself, right? Yeah, I don't look up, um, but um, uh, yeah. So, so I think the the volume of satellite imagery is one thing, and other other satellite data. Again, the amount of content, the our device, the improvements in our devices in these things, you know, it is really uh, has um, increased the resolution and, and the volume of uh, imagery that's out there. The latest version of the iPhone allows you to photograph something and create a 3D model of it. Um, you know, that's that's how advanced it is. Um, and they're pretty good renders too. Um, I see 3D modeling becoming um, something that people will um, start using in this field in particular um augmented reality augmented reality uh, there's a thing called photogrammetry which we partially used in in some of these um investigations where you're basically stitching photographs together but you can put yourself right into that environment um you know there's all of these technologies that are that are coming on stream uh right now well i'm i'm interested in software or technology that would be able to read visual imagery, moving imagery, still photos, rapidly or at scale. Yeah. And one of the reasons I'm interested has to do with YouTube. Honestly, 400 hours of visual imagery is uploaded every minute. Mm -hmm. There are not enough human beings in California to look at that. Yeah. Um, and so the only way anyone gets into YouTube and begins examining something is if they get a complaint. Either our product has been libeled or there's a depiction of an illegal act, something of that sort. And the folks at Google say, we're on it. We're keen to get this done. But seriously, is that even possible? No. And uh, one of the uh, troubles with YouTube and the other platforms is, is that they've deployed AI, artificial intelligence, to detect and to take down footage before they even get a complaint, which has really um, annoyed the human rights community and the journalism community because they are uh, deleting evidence of potentially, actually we know they are deleting evidence of human uh, rights abuses before we even get our eyes on it. Um, and so um, I don't know what's going to happen there with with with, with that, but I think there there has been um, you know pressure to create some sort of version that is uh, available to human rights uh, investigators. On the technology side of it, you know there is that's an interesting development. Like I saw a, a demonstration by a company called Bennett uh, Tech recently, and they um, you know they they're able to take uh, lots of footage and recognize patterns in the footage, you know? Um, so, um, you know, for instance, the inauguration arch way, um, where if there's lots of video filmed there, the computer recognizes, okay, that's a distinctive arch. All of these videos are the same scene and it allows you to sort of organize them um, fairly, fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Let me shift the conversation just a bit 
to the business of journalism. Um, you took six months with a particular investigation with your entire team before you were able to produce the story. Now, this is powerful stuff, but most newspaper editors say if a reporter of mine could only produce two stories a year, I'm not sure he's worth his money. Uh, this is expensive stuff. Yeah. Um, what changes will we see in the business model of journalism that will permit you to continue your work? And what are the threats to all of that? Good question. Um, the I should say that in the course of that investigation, we also kept responding to news and we published, you know, uh, an investigation into, I think, Ashoji happened at the same time, definitely an attack in Nigeria and, um, you know, several of these. What I, I, I think about that is I think, you know, there's obviously an impetus to, to find readers and to bring readers in and um, increase registrations and subscription and traffic because it's a competition with our, our other newsrooms. and. Um, we do respond in the last year in particular, we've responded a lot to breaking news and, and news stories. Um, investigative journalism builds the reputation of the of the institution as well. I think, you know, you're investing in uh, reporters who can find the goods on important stories that will have impact, societal impact, change policy, um, etc. Um, uh, for the better. And um, and that's where you, you're sort of that's where the reputation of the, of the brand sort of comes in. And so I think there's a balance in the business strategy around both of those. I think I, I hope for our team we're hitting both of them. Um, I think in particular since we um, started making better use of our print um, system production system to actually create interactives with graphics and a lot of the sort of stills that you would have seen and little clips that unfortunately I couldn't play. Um, that's a way to be more, more newsy and to be more on the sort of news in the news moment while still like in parallel doing investigations. Um, I don't know if that answers your question fully, but uh, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's important. I, I think a lot of us were just when, when the internet sort of burst into its own in about the year 2000 and small town newspapers began closing. And even here in South Bend, we still have a local newspaper. It's not printed here, it's printed in Fort Wayne. And if you look at the newspaper, it's mostly wire service copy. They're, they're not paying many reporters. So who do they pay? Well, sports reporters, you know, to go cover uh, Notre Dame football and cover uh, high school athletics. But yeah. the threat is there. And, you know, when I was a kid, I was a broadcaster. That was my summer job. And I was fortunate enough to be able to cover for the news director for two weeks. Local radio stations don't have much in the way of news anymore. Um, big cities have all news stations, but m much of it has gone because of conglomerates, it's gone to satellite fed content. Uh, the programmed advertisements are all automatic. And there aren't many people knocking on doors, ringing doorbells, uh, having coffee with a city councilman. Um, do you, what's your impression? Are you worried that um, news gathering organizations are slowly growing extinct? Very worried because of exactly what you outlined there. You know, I think 2000 local uh, papers have been lost over the last 15 years in in the States. Um, I think it's close to 100,000 journalists. Um, and if you think about the effect on that of that on communities, you know, who is, as you say, sitting in on the local council meetings, um, you know, um, who who is who is watching sort of the rising stars? I think my my um, friend Dan Barry was talking about that uh, recently at, at, at a lecture that he gave, you know, you're, you really are losing sort of um, the eyes on the decisions that are being made at a local level that are affecting local populations, um, as well as all of sort of the rich reporting in the community that is being lost as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's a real challenge. I think, unfortunately, the, the future is, um, subscription or some sort of state subvention 
to to have um, to support those medias uh, or other incentives because Google and Facebook are taking up the lion's share. I mean, like you know, sort of 75, 80 percent of digital advertising, um, and that has really, you know, in the absence of of a subscription model and the move to digital as well, um, and the idea that news is free, um, you know, that that really has decimated um, important uh, reporting. Well, just like the music industry, I think uh, Taylor Swift would have something to say about free music. Um, a, a colleague of ours in the Mendoza College of Business, fellow called Paul Gao, published some research um, about a year ago and he found a really astonishing, almost intuitive, but it, it finally someone proved it. Uh, the finding was that in those communities where a local paper had closed, the cost of borrowing money for the city went up. And the simple answer was those who were lending the money didn't trust that there was adequate oversight. And he demonstrated in community after community after community that where a paper closed, that it was more expensive for the city to borrow money for public projects, worthy um, uh, ventures, fixing streets and what have you. But the cost of that went up marginally because the lenders were less trustful because no one was looking over the shoulder of local politicians. Uh um, now, I have a really interesting question here, and it comes from what I'm sure is one of our students. Um, and I'd like to just read it to you. I work with social media in journalism and consume most of my news online. I've always had to justify it to my mom, who thinks real news, in all caps, comes from a physical newspaper. Are there people you've encountered who think less of what you do because it's online and how do you respond to them? Yeah, um, I would say when I, you know, I, I actually didn't start in journalism. I started in, um, I, I'm an engineer and I did computer programming and then I kind of fell into journalism. Uh, I started in print, uh, but when I started in, this area, it was um, with a startup in Dublin that was mining social media and listening to social media for people who were reporting, you know, um, newsworthy events. And these are everyday members of the public. And so I think that was 10 years ago. Um, and as you know, the Arab Spring, you know, was organized and, and played out and, and seen right. social media. You know, I think that even then newsrooms themselves were slow to embrace this. And for us as a startup, that was really valuable because we were, through our, verifi through our journalism verification skills, we were selling a layer of trust. Um, but I, I, I completely sympathize with that because I found it hard to describe to even my own parents <laughs> what it was that I did day to day. And they're like, what? <laughs> you know, you, you have to, you have- People pay you to do that, yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> But for me, you know, journalism is the business of information. Um, and, uh, you know, if you can create a valuable subset uh, of all of the information that is being shared out there in a variety of different platforms, then you really are listening in to the conversations that matter. And it gives you a head start, actually, you as a journalist, it gives you a head start in a competitive newsroom against competitive colleagues, but also against other, you know, to, to bring your newsroom in you know, ahead of um, uh, of other competitors in the landscape, but um, yeah, I, I, again, I I think that the key with social media is, um, you know, being wary of anything that triggers, as I say, emotional responses. That's classic disinformation, uh, and also just asking the questions if it's not from a trusted organization. If it is from a trusted organization, you might also want to ask questions. You know, and 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 uh, and that keeps us accountable too. Double check all of that. Yeah, when I bring reporters, journalists into the classroom and I put them in the front of the room and, and interview them for our students, a question I've asked for many, many years is, do you want to be first or do you want to be right? Well, everyone without fail says, well, of course we want to be both. 
Um, and I say, okay, yeah, what if you don't have a choice? So um, television journalists would frequently say, we wanna be first. Um, it, it's really important for us to be first because that draws an audience. And if you aggregate the audience, you can charge more for your ads. Newspaper journalists would always say, well, if I made a serious mistake and it got into this morning's paper, it's gonna be there all day long and it's not going away. And while people will throw the newspaper out tomorrow, uh, the morgue copies, the file copies will always have that error in there. Now I find newspaper journalists saying to me, well, you know, I wanna be right, of course, but if I put it up on the website and there are some inaccuracies, we can always correct it on the fly as we go. Is there a danger there that you put up a half-baked story before it's fully baked because you know you can change it? Yeah, absolutely, there is. I mean, you want to be, you want to be, as you're saying, uh, lots of journalists want to be right, be, or want to be first. You always want to be right, but they want to be first. I think, you know, somebody said something insightful to me a, a few years ago. People never remember who was first, but they always <laughs> remember who was wrong. And, you know, you, you, your reputation. No. Huh? I, I, well, I remember when Ronald Reagan was shot, um, Frank Reynolds at the anchor desk at ABC, a fellow at Parkland or wherever the hospital was, oh, GW, GW Hospital in Washington, D.C., said, you know, live on the air that um, Jim Brady, the press secretary, had died. And he went on for a few seconds. And then, uh, you know, Reynolds was pretty somber and they, they went on to talk about other parts of the story. And then uh, the reporter came back on and said, well, we're told now by uh, the Associated Press, I forgot his exact words, but you know, Jim Brady is not as dead as we thought he was. Uh, you know, apparently he's, he's okay now. Um, Reynolds just sat there and he said, we have an obligation to the public, to the world with all of this news. Next time you come to me with a story, get it right. And I don't think we saw that fellow on the air again uh, at ABC, certainly. So knowing that it's right is so important. Um, you know, Phil Graham, who famously said when he was publisher of the Washington Post, um, that journalism is the first rough draft of history. Um, and to what obligation do you feel when you work with a story to be absolutely certain you know that what you're doing is right? Yeah, an incredible obligation. And I, you know, because of the institution of the times, the number of people that are going to see it, um, it's an incredible pressure to, to make sure that we're um, accurately depicting whatever it is we're investigating. Uh, breaking news is obviously more difficult. Um, we don't occupy that realm as much, but we, we have done. And, you know, if you take this uh, January last year, when um, uh, it, you know, it, they were denying it at the time, but, but Iran had shot down a passenger plane um, and they yeah. were saying they were attributing it to engine failure. Again, this is the value of social media and listening in the right places. Our team were listening in to the parlor chats that were happening in Farsi, in communities in uh, around Tehran where the plane went down, but also a group that sprung up of is Israeli citizens who were sharing information about it because there was a lot of concern and a video popped up on there that purported to show um, the, the, the plane being struck. My colleague Christian Trebert kicked the video over to me. Me and the team started trying to geolocate it, find out where it was filmed. And he meanwhile got in touch with the source and was asking the source questions on the phone. And we had already gathered a lot of information. This is two days after the plane had gone down. Um, the short, the long and the short of it is that we were able to verify it. We were able to do um, echolocation, uh, 
you know, confirm that the flight was on that trajectory, that the, yeah. when you see the, the, the flash in between the time you, it takes to hear it, that that distance was accurate <clears throat> using the old Pythagoras theorem and, um, and all of these sort of uh, fact checks as well as vetting the source. And an hour and a half after we got the video, we were able to say, okay, Iran shot down um, the Ukrainian uh, airliner. Mm. And they admitted it a day later. Um, nice. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but we had to be absolutely sure. We had Matt Purdy, who's deputy editor of the paper, Steve, Dwight, like lots of the um, sort of top editors around the computer, making sure that we characterize this and explain how we know what we know. Minimizing your risk. Yeah. Well, uh, Malky, as, as I've heard in Dublin pubs uh, so many times, I used to teach in Dublin. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the hour has come. And so uh, I'll thank you for your expertise, your time, your willingness to share those with us. And I will say that when life permits us to remove a mask and gather again, uh, we'd really like to have you on the Notre Dame campus. We would love to bring you out here. So let's jot that into your uh, diary and uh, let's make a point of it. Malachi, thank you so much. My pleasure, and thank you. I'd love to. Good. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. We have uh, about a month's break until our next guest, who will be Suzanne Spaulding from the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. That'll be March 12th, four weeks from today. So use your time wisely. Join us again on Friday the 12th, and we'll see you at 1040 that morning. Thanks, everyone. We appreciate you joining us.